Okay, so if we can start with a fairly simple one, um, have you always wanted to work in the IT industry or was it something you came to later in your career? How did you get into, this, into the industry? Um, it certainly wasn't where my career started. Um, I spent the first 15 years of my career working in marketing, actually, so quite different. Um, so I, um, I began um, as a marketer. I ended up launching three financial services brands into the market and um, always in regulated industries. So what happened for me was I discovered that I really loved um, working with regulatory change and trying to find ways to make that commercially successful for organisations. Um, and when GDPR came along, um, my marketing background told me that it was actually the answer to all of my problems. Um, so all of the things that GDPR was making mandatory seemed like excellent marketing practice to me. Um, and so I ended up going and working with a, a, a consultancy that helped organisations with GDPR. Um, went in for three days to one client, stayed for 13 months. And when I came out, they asked me to lead the data privacy team there. Um, and that's how I, I got into data privacy. And, and I was right as well, I have to say. Um, it has turned out to be as fascinating, useful, wonderful a, a thing to spend my career doing as I could have hoped for. Um, but yeah, very much a different thing from starting off in marketing. Okay, and, um, and in terms of where you are now, um, data privacy is still a thing, but have you progressed sort of career-wise to you know, a more important role? What, what Just your sort of data privacy journey, I guess. Um, so I'm the head of data privacy for GemServe. So I'm uh, the most senior woman in the cyber and privacy practice here. Um, and I run our team of data privacy experts. Uh, but we work very closely alongside um, everybody across our digital practice. So the cybersecurity experts, the um, data analytics team, uh, we have digital architects and things as well. Um, because all of those things obviously come together to form a project. And what the data privacy team really is for um, is for making sure that while you're building the project, you don't get so excited by the thing that you're building that you forget about the people that you're building it for. So we need to be able to bring in the technical knowledge, but sort of tie that to the people um, and, and make sure that it sort of everything comes together. Um, so in terms of, it's sort of how my career has progressed, um, obviously I've, I've come through marketing to begin with, um, I ended up in, you know, in leadership positions as a marketer. Um, so I was on you know, leadership teams there. Um, and then quite quickly, when I moved into data privacy, um, within around about a year, um, I was back into management, back into leading the business that I was working for, being part of the leadership team there. Um, that was the organisation I worked with before I worked there, before I worked where I work now. Um, and when I came across to GemServe, um, it's again to lead the data privacy practice, to be part of the management team within the cyber and digital practice. And just in terms of a slightly left field thing, I mean, GDPR and, and data privacy is, is, is a big thing. Are you a sort of optimist that you know, what's going on in the political world, the data privacy will, we will get the right answers in the, in the UK and further afield? Or are you slightly nervous that when it comes to the states and Europe and then the UK perhaps trying to do that I think it's going to end up in a bit of a dog's dinner or do you think everyone will work out that it's important to get it right so, so something will happen positively? Um, it's a really interesting question there is one of the things that makes data privacy so fascinating is it is constantly changing we are in a world where there are new global and US state laws coming out all the time you know, I think what you're referring to there is we've obviously just had the executive order coming from America, changing that. In the UK, we've been talking about coming up with a new bill um, for how data protection should work in the UK, which may or may not replace the last new bill that came out only a few weeks ago. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a world of constant change. Um, but the, the common thread behind it all is principles that you know go back to the 1970s or even beyond um, and they're rooted in human rights and for all of the sort of the specific expression of it changes that never does um, and really it's about trying to find the way to 
to achieve those core principle values and requirements um, and to do that in the best way. So I think what we're looking at at the moment really is um, the policy and regulatory exploration, if you like, to find the way um, to find a way that, that that works, but that that keeps working as the world changes, as innovations, you know, change the way that um, that data is used in the world. Um, at heart, when new laws come in, you know, because it's it all coming back to those same common shared principles. Um, it, it, there's actually a lot of similarity between everything that's going on. Um, it's it's just the it's the specifics of how it expresses the changes um, and the engagement with organisations to make it actually technically um, possible to do. So going back to your question, I, I guess I am quite optimistic. I, I think what I see is an industry that's really alive, really tackling those really big questions and um, you know, working very hard to stay up to date and addressing what we need to see in the world. So I think it's exciting. Okay, and in terms, I mean, there's clearly challenges around that, but back to the sort of conversations main topic. Um, have you yourself experienced challenges, you know, as your career has developed? And, and bear in mind, as I say, the, the focus of the, the conversation I'm having with people is, as do you think your gender has been an issue at any stage or have you enjoyed a you know, fairly, shall we say, stress-free uh, career path? Um, do you know, it's a really interesting question. I think, I think it, it must have done. Um, and in a variety of different ways. And I'm sure that's actually true for a lot of people. Um, I'm very conscious that for most of my career, you know, I have generally been the only woman in the room um, most of the time. Certainly the more senior you get, the more often that's the case. Um, at GemServe, I have to say, you know, this is probably the most sort of, it feels the most equal and the most diverse organisation that I've worked in. Um, and some of the more interesting characters um, that I've worked with. There have no equivalents here, and that is jolly nice, I have to say. Um, but there are, you know, there are downsides to these things. There are ways that I think people probably aren't necessarily thinking about how they're behaving sometimes, which is not so good. But on the other hand, um, it can be really helpful to stand out. And when you are the only woman and the only female voice in the room, and, um, then you know you you do stand out and so in terms of um seeing how it sort of affected my career I mean potentially it has you know given me a bit more of a, a profile because I'm more obviously there in some ways um perhaps yeah um it's you know it's a mixed bag isn't it everything mm -hmm. is really <laughs> and in terms of um you, you know, your career, have you seen attitudes change at all during that? You know, has it be, have you found you? I don't know, you know, something as crude as you've been treated with more respect over the years, or is that partly because you've got more senior roles, or or do you think you know the, the, the sort of male chauvinist attitude that maybe did exist way back when has, has largely dissipated? I'd just be interested to you know whether you've observed sort of definite changes, or, or you know, it's still in a bit of a state of flux. Um. It's, it's a really interesting question and it's quite difficult to know what the exact answer is because I've worked in a lot of different organisations over my career and I've done two very different kinds of roles and it's quite hard to know how to separate cultures, individuals and, and to know, you know how, that, how that interacts with the time that I've gone through in my career as well. Um, so it's, you know, it's certainly the case that I've had my share of experiences that wouldn't have been shared by men right? um, I don't suppose there were many men who've been asked to sit on somebody's knee but I have um, by somebody more senior than me um, so you know some of those things but at the same time I've always been very conscious that that is not normal behavior um, and the people who are doing that are very much out of line. And I think it's really important that actually, you know, if anybody is still experiencing that kind of thing um, and, and is seeing that sort of, you know, out, well, out of order behaviour going on, that they recognise that it's the person who's doing that and not the person who's on the receiving end of it, who's, who's in the wrong here. And um, certainly there is, you know, now there's way more of a conversation 
since Me Too and all of those things that have happened, there's, there's much more of a conversation around that, much more of a, uh, an organisational thought process. You know, diversity and inclusion is much more of a thing than it, it, it was at the beginning of my career. Um, and I think organisations are a lot more intentional and, and recognise those kinds of things. So I'd like to believe <laughs> that those kinds of things are, are much less common. I'm sure they haven't disappeared entirely. Um, I'd like to believe that they're a lot more, less common. Um, but yeah, I think that the main thing that I would say to anybody who is still experiencing is please just recognise it's, it's not right and that shouldn't be happening and, and it's not you in the wrong. So, you know, do something about it, call it out. <laughs> and, and do you think um, more generally, the, in the IT industry specific, there's more that could be done to encourage women to, to pursue a career? I mean, does it still have that profile, do you think, to the outside world of, of you know, your typical you know, male geek that you know, goes into the industry and therefore women are perhaps nervous of doing it? Do you, what, how do you see you know, people looking from the outside in maybe wanting a career is it attractive to, to women to get into the industry or, or more needs to be done do you think um so i think if you look at the demographics you can see an improvement um over where we've been sort of historically but there is still a long way to go at the moment and there are some really exciting initiatives that are going on to encourage women into um, it and into stem careers more generally as well um so again it's part of what i was talking about before that i think um there's a general awareness that something needs to happen here and there are improvements and it would be beneficial. Um, and it, but, you know, that's certainly the case. So at GEMSERVE, uh, we have a number of initiatives that we're, we're doing to try and encourage women into um, IT careers. Um, so we've just started sponsoring a programme called Empowering Women to Lead in Cybersecurity, for example. And the whole point of that is to um, take you know, some of the best women in cybersecurity out there and give them coaching and mentoring to encourage them to see this as a career that they can really build for themselves. Um, the, you know, to an extent, we need to create space for women to rise through the ranks. It tends to be a career that's quite sticky for a lot of people and you stay in a career for a long time. So creating space at the top for women to rise up is a challenge um, for a lot of organisations, I think. Um, but the sector is growing. So you know, growth brings those opportunities and that will happen. Um, but I think the best thing that we can be doing at the moment is um, building on what we've got, which is quite a lot of initiatives to make women in cybersecurity and in IT um, much more visible. Um, let people see women doing those jobs and doing them well and, and encourage them to see that as being a path that they too can follow. Um, and then make sure that we're putting the things in place to make sure that that is actually the experience women have. So really be quite you know, intentional about creating that and about showing people the opportunities and making sure that those opportunities do grow and appear for people. And in terms of folks that might be you know, considering a career in, in the space, um, I mean, perhaps two part question. One, it sounds like you've enjoyed a, you know, immensely your, your career today in it. So, how rewarding can a career be if you, if you can put that into words and secondly you know advice to people look you know looking in are there particular things you'd, you'd suggest they need to do as they're looking to get into the industry or do they just sort of go for it and see what happens along the way um so so to answer the first part of your question yeah it's it is an incredibly vast space there are so many different kinds of career that you can have in IT um, and they they vary from you know very female friendly so data privacy has a lot of women in it um, well I think probably more than 50 50 female actually my end of the pool through to other areas where there are fewer women um, but in general you're seeing an improved gender uh, balance going on I think well certainly you know it's improving over time um, and it is endlessly fascinating. This is one of those careers where it never stands still. The things we can do with computers you know, in five years' time will be unrecognisable. Um, we're constantly creating new dimensions. There are new things happening. You, you knowledge never stands still. And it, it just makes for the most rewarding, interesting, sort of, you know, endlessly fun career that you could have. And who wouldn't want to go and work somewhere like that, really? Um, in terms of what women should be doing, um, get just 
be out there, take the opportunities that are coming up. There are, you know, I talked about the Empowering Women to Lead in Cybersecurity Programme, but there are also um, lots of women in cyber chapters that you can join in various organisations and um, take part in those. Um, you know, there's so many opportunities out there. Um, and be be interested, you know, revel in it, have have the fun that there is to have in this career. And that's what people are looking for, for people who see how much interest there is to be had and, and are interested in creating themselves a career. Um, and for me personally, I find it useful to try and think about being not just one skill, but bringing different things together. So thinking about what you as a woman in IT and in cyber um, what your personal journey can bring to the table and why you personally have got a particular space for yourself. If you can create that, then I think your career will just naturally develop from there. That's lovely. I mean, it's been good to talk to you and maybe just as we, as we finish, um, a bit like Desert Island Disc, where I think you're allowed to take one, <laughs> one item with you. Um, in this case, I'm going to ask you if, if there is one thing you could change about the IT industry, um, what, what would that be? I mean, maybe you're allowed to, you know, to push the, the bar to two if you've got two things, but no, just just what you'd like to see change, perhaps. Um, so I think one of the things that I am particularly interested in just on a personal level is trying to see how we can break down silos and bring different parts of organisations together. Um, and I would that would be the thing that I'd like to see change in IT. Um, I think because a lot of the time what IT does is pretty much magical from most people's point of view. Um, it, it can be left that way and quite mysterious to the rest of the organisation. Um, and for that reason, you can end up in a position where IT, you know, perhaps can be a little disconnected from the rest of the organization and may not even realize it because it's more to do with the rest of the organization not understanding what it does, its priorities, you know, what, it, what its concerns are. Um, so if there was one thing I could change with the IT industry, I think it would be trying to find ways to, to reach out and build those connections with other business areas. For me personally, I'm obviously talking about this having come into the industry from marketing and I can see these ways that marketing and IT can connect now that I never understood when I was just working in marketing. Um, and, and I can see from the work that I do, because we spend so much time looking through processes and figuring out how things work and what kind of controls and how to make things better. So for me, I, I, I'm seeing very much um, that the more we can connect different parts of the organisation together, the greater the sum of the parts becomes. So that's what I'd love to see, to see IT really think about how it connects, how it explains itself, how it finds out about other parts of the organisation, bring that all together, make something wonderful. That's great. Well, it's been really enjoyable to chat to you and thanks for sharing some, some great insights. So Camilla, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Thank you.